Native people, Native culture, Native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international Native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier Native voice in Native programming. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the air There's a heartbeat deep inside our mother Are you too cool to care? Now, with Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello, welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native News, Native Entertainment. I'm your hostess, Jeannie Green. So glad to have you with us. This week, we've traveled to beautiful Southeast Alaska to the community of Heidelberg, Alaska for their celebration of Haida Day. So glad to be invited to that beautiful community in Southeast Alaska. John Active is here with Native News across the country. Don't go away. Right back. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by the Aurora Alaska Premium Smoked Salmon and Seafoods Company, an Alaska Native-owned company, proud to sponsor Heartbeat Alaska. And by Ute Air Alaska, official airlines of Heartbeat Alaska. Ute Air Alaska, taking you home. By Northwest Arctic Borough. Another sponsor of Heartbeat Alaska, and by... Alaska Fiber Star, a proud sponsor of Heartbeat Alaska. It's my home, home, Alaska. Alaska's where I call my home. John Active is with us now with Native News across the country. By the way, if you have any news for John, give us a call here at Heartbeat Alaska, 907-563-7440, or fax us, 907-563-7440. 9309. Thanks, Jeannie. I'm back after several weeks of practicing my subsistence activities. It's good to see the birds, the fish, and other edibles growing off the land here. Speaking of which, from St. Paul, Minnesota, three bands of Chippewa, the Millilax, Fond du Lac, and Bad River have harvested nearly uh, 4,000 pounds of walleye during the first nine days of the treaty fishing season, which began April 1st in Minnesota. The total quota of walleye allowed on the biggest lake, Millilax, is 40,000 pounds, of which over 3,200 pounds have been taken. And from Cleveland, Ohio, an effigy of the Cleveland Indians logo Chief Wahoo went up in flames April 10th. Five people were arrested on suspicion of arson, but were released on bond. The Committee of 500 Years of Dignity and Resistance says it will continue to protest the logo at home games because they consider the logo racist. From Billings, Montana, one of three federal indictments against Crow Chairwoman Clara Nomi was dismissed in district court. U.S. Attorney Carl Rosted did not oppose the motion, but vowed to take the case back to the grand jury and seek a new indictment with additional charges. The indictment included two counts accusing Nomi of stealing money from the tribe's Little Bighorn Casino. About two dozen Blackfeet members who worked at the casino were charged in indictments with conspiracy and stealing money from the operation last year. Investigation continues in this matter. From Madison, Wisconsin, a report of the University of Wisconsin Systems Board of Regents says the University of Wisconsin's Green Bay and Stevens Point campuses experienced a drop in the number of new undergraduate minority students in several categories last fall. The report said Green Bay had 38 new black American Indian and Hispanic Latino students during the fall of 1997, down from 50 the previous year. 
the entire University of Wisconsin system had nearly 2,000 new minority students last fall, an increase of 14% from the previous fall, according to the report. And from Santa Fe, New Mexico, the keepers of the Treasures Cultural Council of American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Hawaiians will hold its seventh annual conference in Santa Fe on June 15th through the 18th at the Santa Fe Indian School. Native language and repatriating the spirit of nations will highlight the importance of native languages as well as present workshops and panels on how some native communities are working to utilize, preserve, and rejuvenate their languages. Good for them. I'll be right back after these messages. In St. Paul, Minnesota, a Minneapolis man has filed a lawsuit in U.S. District Court claiming that police maced him, called him a drunken Indian, and dumped him in the snow where he was later found by friends. The lawsuit names two officers, one who was later fired and the other suspended for 30 days over the incident which occurred in November. Temperatures around the time of the incident were around 21 degrees. Michael Greenleaf of Red Lake is seeking appropriate compensatory and punitive damages. From Olympia, Washington, the Washington Supreme Court has agreed to review a controversial lower court ruling that affirmed the rights of Indian treaty tribes to hunt unrestricted on public land. The case, which prompted two rallies at the Capitol last month by angry non-tribal hunters, stems from a 1995 incident in which a member of the Nooksack tribe of western Washington killed a bull elk in the Oak Creek wildlife area near Yakima, even though he didn't have a state hunting license. And finally, from Oak Park, Illinois, on May 2nd, Midwest Soaring, which stands for Save Our Ancestors' Remains and Resources Indigenous Network Group, is sponsoring a prayer vigil on the steps of the State Capitol Building in Springfield, Illinois. The state of Illinois has consistently ignored the requests of Native people to both set aside land for reburial of the ancestors. Repeated attempts to address these needs have been consistently ignored over years of effort, and a public gathering to plead for the help from the Creator is clearly the next step. Representatives of all nations who once lived in Illinois territory are urged to attend this gathering, displaying the banner of their nation as a sign of protest. This vigil is scheduled on National Prayer Day and is dedicated to the three R's, respect, repatriation, and reburial. And that concludes Native news from across the country for this week. I, myself, am going to go and practice a little bit more subsistence here in the next couple of days. And after I do some of that, 
I'll be back to bring you more news from across the country. Thank you for watching. I'm John Ack. Thank you so much, John. We travel now to Southeast Alaska and visit the beautiful community of Heidelberg, Alaska for Heide Day. Heidelberg, Alaska is located on the Prince of Wales Islands in Southeast Alaska. It was founded in 1911 by the consolidation of three former Indian villages, Haukan, Klinkwan, and Sukwan. The native village of Heidelberg was established by the government to provide for one central school. The community is composed of about 95% Haida Indians, whose ancestors came from Queen Charlotte Island of British Columbia. Heidelberg claims uniqueness as the only Haida village in the United States, although there are many Haidas in other Alaska villages. The Haidas are a proud and strong people. Theirs is a rich cultural Today was history. Haida Day in Heidelberg, and um, it was just a, a day we've had for um, 18 years now, on May 18th every year, and um, it's just a sharing of the culture, and this year was it was all new with the teachers. Um, Sherilyn um, did an outstanding job, really an outstanding job, but it's just a way of sharing the culture with the children and um, having a fun day together at the village, and I, I can't even express to you that the emph the emph enthusiasm of one person like Sherilyn how much it showed up at that school today and, and that's just one super dynamic person that um, has come home and um, made things just beautiful. Hi today is a day celebrating their culture a day of celebrating today's preservation of their culture and yesterday's rich history yesterday a time where men and women worked together in the village Women gathered roots and berries, seaweed, and materials for basketry. They prepared, cooked, and preserved all foods, tanned animal skins, made all the clothing and basketry. Men fished and hunted both sea and land animals. They built houses, made the large canoes, and did all the wood carving and painting. think right now but thank you everybody it's been a big pleasure doing this it's just so fun to see it going on and now we're going to do our exit song and we'd like you all to join us for lunch out in the in the lobby after <laughs> Today, a Haida Day meant, meant a great deal to our people, not only to the students, the teachers, uh, the uh, town people, the Haida Nation. Uh, this is the day we call a show-off day, a day where everyone to show what they've done throughout the year, what they learn from the teachers. And they are uh, today. They are showing off with their regalas, 
beautiful regalas. Everyone had their hats on, the Haida hat, and they had chief hat. There were several different kind of hats we had with, uh, uh, among our, t our students. The, we had a very good drummers, got good singers, they are good dancers today. They were a beautiful day. This was a beautiful day to, to have today, the Haida um, day. Gloria and I went to school here together, and we had some really good role models. The old Nons here and the Chinas, they really worked a lot to get us where we are, and if we didn't learn, then we wouldn't have the ability to teach. I think it's real important, and I think more the kids should be involved in it. You know, this, this really set a spark to the fire, and a lot of the kids are excited about it. The ones who didn't take part wish they did. So um, the culture is really important here. It's just, it's been dying off slowly. You know, people have been losing interest, but now I think we got them back. It's real exciting. My belief is that everyone is racing so far hard into the year 2000, they're forgetting what worked and a lot of the traditional ways of Native peoples worked. It worked then and if we could utilize them today, it would work now. It was all about respect and honor and pride. That was everything then and that's what should be everything now. Our Haida culture, it never changed a great deal. Uh, we've had this height of culture for, since 1950. It's when we started here in Heidelberg. And we had uh, the culture we put through the school system. So all the students in our village will have something to learn. From the, and the elders were invi uh, invited to come in. There's about eight elders that took part in this. And we've had a lot of teachers, uh, di different different teachers took part, and and uh, our t our t culture I think is off the ground now because we can read and write the language now, the Haida language, the Haida Nation. You could read and write the language now, and the st I'm very proud of the students because they can l pick up a song fast. And they they know that they are the cultured people. Hope you all enjoy the dancing and come on to Heidelberg for the totem pole raising and look us up at celebration. August 15th, Stan Marsden carved the elders of Heidelberg a pole and it's called the Friendship Pole Tle'i. And that's kind of gonna be a big day down here and he honored himself and he honored our elders. He's a master carver and it'll be a beautiful day. How uh. The earliest recorded contact between Haida and Europeans was in 1774 when the Spanish explorer Juan Perez reached the Queen Charlotte Islands and traded with Haida Indians there. He was met by these canoes some 50 feet long. It must have been a formidable sight. In some Haida oral traditions, there are stories of voyages to Hawaii. Historic time is often known by first contact with Europeans. But Northwest Coast Indians had a vibrant history and kept oral historical records long before the arrival of the Europeans. Thank you so very much, everyone in Heidelberg, Alaska, for your help on this story. I'm still waiting for my herring eggs, by the way. Hope they come soon. Let's take a moment now for some good Native American music, and I'll be right back.
And now for a news update with John Active. As of Friday night, May 29th, the state Senate narrowly voted to place on the November ballot a constitutional amendment recognizing a subsistence preference based on place of residence, but one that will become effective only when all federal court appeals on the federal subsistence mandate are exhausted. The proposal also requires the governor to file a lawsuit and join existing litigation challenging the constitutionality of the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, the federal law that requires the state to recognize a rural subsistence preference. The House of Representatives also must approve any amendment headed to the ballot. Opponents of this latest effort say the measure is an empty promise because it will not prevent a federal takeover of subsistence hunting and fishing management on December 1st. The legislature began the fourth day of its special session on subsistence as a House committee discussed the new approach that eventually failed Friday night. A constitutional amendment that would have provided a subsistence priority to Alaskans who demonstrate customary and traditional dependence on the fish and game. But that approach necessitated changes to the federal law that requires a subsistence preference in Alaska. It faced immediate opposition 
from the Alaska Federation of Natives and Governor Knowles. Work continues on this important legislation, but no one believes in their heart of hearts that a compromise will be reached and the federal government will take over management of fish and game in Alaska come December 1st. Thank you so much for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Entertainment. Once again, thank you all the wonderful people that live in Heidelberg, Alaska that shared the expense of sending our photographer down there. And by the way, if you have news from anywhere in the state of Alaska, from across Canada, from any reservation in the lower 48, we're here for you and we'd like to share what's going on in your community. Give us a call and we'll see what we could do to get your news on the air. God bless you. I'm Jenny Green bringing you Native News and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>